Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and you are watching One Mind Syndicate. Today we continue talking about the Primarchs and the Space Marines, as we get into each individual genetic flaw found in the Primarchs that they passed on to their successor chapters. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40k content every single day, and we're doing a 100,000 subscriber giveaway prize thingy at the end of this video, so stay tuned to the very end of the video. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the genetic flaws of the Primarchs and their successor chapters. Every Space Marine chapter is defined by the legacy of their Primarch. Through their gene seed, these mighty beings would shape their son's bodies, while through teachings and philosophy, they would influence their minds. But unfortunately, many Primarchs suffered from genetic abnormalities that led to genetic mutations and deviance from the common stable stock. These genetic flaws came to define many of the first founding legions and would play a big role in developing their successor chapters. To understand each genetic flaw, we must look at each individual Primarch and their unique characteristics. Fulgrim was the Primarch of the Emperor's children. He was said to be one of the best looking and charismatic individuals of all 18 Primarchs found in Imperial records. And although it seemed that he suffered from no genetic flaw, he did deviate from the rest of his brothers in that he had a psychological tendency towards personal achievement and competition to prove his superiority as well as an incredible physique. This was passed on to his legion, the Emperor's Children, who inherited the genetic predisposition to finely sculpted physiques, a noble bearing, and finely controlled thought processes, with the same psychological tendency of perfection as their Primarch Fulgrim. The only physical abnormality was the occasional incident of albinism and a shift in iris color to violet in some recruits. Such minor effects of gene seed implantation and conditioning process did nothing to distract from the aura of aesthetic refinement that clung to the Third Legion. The Lord of Iron, or Percherabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors, was born with a couple of genetic flaws and deviations. The most important and often least talked about was his natural affinity towards problem solving. He might not have possessed the warp lore of Magnus the Red or the Warcraft of Horus, but he possessed a calculating mind, well suited to the highly technical aspects of warfare. He was also born with a natural awareness of the presence of the Eye of Terror, and could perceive the echo of it on every world where he looked up to the heavens. The anomaly haunted his dreams, threaded his nightmares, and colored his every thought since he had learned of its nature. Percherabo did not pass on his sensitivity toward the Eye of Terror to his children, but what he did pass on was a marked tendency towards suspicion and paranoia. This genetic flaw drove a wedge between the Iron Warriors and the rest of the Space Marine Legions, ultimately culminating in their betrayal. Agatai Khan, the Warhawk, or the Great Khan, was the Primarch of the White Scars. He suffered from a genetic flaw that he passed on to his children, sparked because of his upbringing on the world of Chogoris. Known as the Chagorian Savagery, this ferocity within their hearts and their blood granted them great power, but it also threatened to consume all that they are and damn them. All White Scars are watchful of this necessary yet insidious savagery, and it is only with great discipline, humble introspection, and often the watchful eye of their battle brothers that they can hope to master themselves. Lehman Russ, also known as the Wolf King and the Great Wolf, is the Primarch of the Space Wolves. He was most famous for possessing the altered gene seed called the Canis Helix, or Spirit of the Wolf. Different than most genetic flaws, the Canis Helix is intentionally activated into every Space Wolf neophyte. A Space Wolf must face the risk of this mutation in order to be accepted into the pack. When a Space Wolf aspirant is deemed worthy to join the chapter, he partakes in a sacred ceremony where he imbibes the Canis Helix a genetic cocktail drawn from the genome of Lehman Russ and used as a catalyst to activate the genetically engineered viral machinery of the aspirant's gene seed implants. This mixture is drunk from an ancient relic of the Space Wolves, known as the Cup of Wolfen. Every Space Wolf then runs the risk of succumbing to the curse of the Wolfen. They turn into half-man, half-wolf beasts that cannot control their savagery 
While this is not always a guaranteed or immediate fate, every space wolf must carry this genetic flaw. As space wolf Astartes grow older and more experienced in battle, the Canis Helix causes additional physical alterations. Their hair turns gray, their fangs grow even longer, their skin becomes even more leathery, and in some rare cases, their eyes turn yellow. It is speculated, though not known for sure, that some latent genetic irregularity in the Canis Helix accounts for the unusual, elemental-based psychic abilities of those space wolves who eventually become the chapter's rune priests. The Primarch Rogodorn did not suffer from any genetic flaw, nor did the Imperial Fists, but there is one successor chapter known as the Excoriators that suffered from what they called Dorn's Darkness. When Dorn's Darkness takes one of their numbers, it might appear to the untrained eye as merely a wretched palsy, a slackness of the jaw, a tremor of the limb, a blankness of the eye. But those who survive it report the experience as a living nightmare, a sleeping wakefulness in which they relive the bottomless woe of Dorn's most trying time the mortal wound of the Emperor of Mankind during the final hours of the Battle of Terra. It is both the genetic blessing of the sons of Dorn's Primarch and a curse upon his sons. It is to know the possibility, for even a second, of an Imperium without the Emperor, to feel what Dorn felt, the profound misery of a Primarch, the paralyzing fear that even a man as great as Dorn experienced for himself and for mankind over the Emperor's broken body after the end of the battle. While enthralled by the darkness, its victims cannot speak or communicate, they cannot feed themselves or take water, and seem feverishly insensible to everything happening about them. Those excoriators who fall victim to the darkness are left in the care of the chapter's Santiarch, a senior chaplain. The Santiarch, Balshasar, offers the victims of the darkness a spiritual treatment that either cures them or ultimately results in their death, since the excoriators are often a fleet-bound chapter. He has the afflicted interned within a decorative stasis casket that is transported from the chapter's reclusium on their homeworld of Eshar. The casket is beaten from dull adamantium, and the box has the dimensions of a sarcophagus and the extravagant garniture to match. Its front piece features a raised depiction of the emperor. Even though the casket stands upright, it represents the emperor as prone, maimed, and broken as he was immediately following the confrontation with Horus. Belshazzar's solution to the affliction of the darkness is to create a spiritual darkness of his own within the stasis sarcophagus. It is the most solitary of confinements, where no self-respecting excoriator needs look upon his own weakness, and where he might summon the strength of will to banish the darkness of the Primarch and recover his sanity. It is not known whether or not the Excoriators are the only Imperial Fist successor chapter afflicted by this genetic deficiency. Conrad Kurz, better known as the Night Haunter, is the Primarch of the Night Lords. He was born with a gift of divination, but was only able to see the darkest path of all possible futures, a terrible curse that damaged his psychic balance and caused him to search for only oblivion from the pain of his reality. This curse was passed on to the sorcerers of the Night Lords, and the genetic flaw came with a pronounced vulnerability that caused them to be racked with painful seizures whenever the visions come. The Night Lords also suffered from physical abnormalities like jet black eyes and pale skin, which became even more prevalent with the introduction of the genetic material of the dour people of Nostromo. The Great Angel Sanguinius is the Primarch of the Blood Angels, and the Primarch connected to the most well-known genetic flaw of all the Space Marine Legions. But first, Sanguinius himself suffered from a genetic mutation that gave him vestigial wings, like those of an angel, emerging from his back. He was indeed angelic, not just physically, but also within his unblemished soul. But the same cannot be said about the sons of Sanguinius. Deep within the psyche of every blood angel is a destructive yearning, a battle fury and blood hunger that must be held in check in every waking moment. This curse is known as the Red Thirst. The Red Thirst is the blood angel's darkest secret and greatest curse, but it is also their greatest salvation, for it brings with it a humility and understanding of their own failing which makes them truly the most noble of the Space Marines. Those affected by the Red Thirst often have pale skin and a potent urge to drink the blood of their enemies, 
that can emerge at any time during combat. Along with the Red Thirst, the Blood Angels and their successor chapters suffer from the psychic imprint left by Sanguinius' death. Known as the Black Rage, this can cause them to go insane prior to or during battle and fuel the rage that Sanguinius himself felt during the Battle of Terra. When a Space Marine is overcome by the Black Rage, he is reborn into a world of constant anger, hatred, fury, and nothing else. As well as Sanguinius' memories, the Blood Angels and their kin are genetically touched with a small portion of the Primarch's unearthly power, boosting his strength and vitality to superhuman levels. Ferris Manus, also known as the Gorgon, was the Primarch of the Iron Hands, and although he possessed two mechanized hands, they were not adopted due to a genetic flaw, but rather a horrible accident in the Primarch's youth. The only genetic flaw Ferris Manus passed down to his children was the extreme hatred for the weakness of the flesh. But even this is thought to be a flaw in the gene seed of the chapter that originated some time after the death of the Primarch. During Ferris Manus' life with his legion, he despised weakness. By his presence on the battlefield, the Primarch drove his men to act of superhuman endurance and remorseless fever, but he never preferred machine over body. Angron sometimes called the Red Angel, is the Primarch of the World Eaters. He was a proud warrior of fearsome skill and even stronger sense of honor. Ferocious in combat, he passed on his battle-hardened wrath to his legion. When Angron took control of his legion, he instigated a program of replicating the cranial implants he himself had been fitted with as a slave warrior. Knowing that the devices granted such advantages in speed, aggression, and strength, that no enemy in the galaxy could stand before his legion once all had received them. While not a genetic flaw, many Imperial savants suspected that these implants added to the existing genetic deviance of the World Eaters Legion. It was suspected that they had a physical need to shed blood and kill, a driving imperative that sends them into a berserker fury of unrestrained bloodthirsty psychosis. Mortarion, also known as the Death Lord, was the Primarch of the Death Guard. Landing on the waste-infected world of Barbarus, Mortarion survived the toxic air where a normal child would have suffocated and died. He was a tall, pale, and gaunt man, all characteristics that were passed on to his legion. The only notable genetic deviance found in Mortarion's gene seed was the Death Guard's resilience to contagions and toxins, a genetic flaw that was further exploited when the Death Guard began to recruit from the feral and toxic world of Barbarus. Magnus the Red is the Primarch of the Thousand Suns, and the only Primarch to know of his importance to the Imperium of Man since birth. Magnus possessed a form of psychic communication with his father even during his gestation. Magnus's tremendous psychic talent was the intention of the Emperor, who engineered him with his genetic structure. Although he is depicted as having copper skin, this was not due to his genetic makeup, but rather the effect of Prospero's son, and he could change and maintain his appearance depending on who was viewing him, all thanks to his psychic abilities. Magnus was unquestionably the most profoundly mutated of the Emperor's Primarchs, both physically and psychically, and the Legion imprinted with his gene seed reflected that with a high percentage of the Thousand Suns, manifesting some level of psychic ability. Unfortunately, this higher rate of psychic ability came with a problem. Magnus's genome was ultimately flawed. This flaw manifested itself in what was called the Flesh Change, a mutation that would strike down multiple Thousand Suns and devolve them from superhuman warriors to ravaging masses of mutating flesh. This often led to them becoming what later generations would recognize as Chaos Spawn. Lorgar is the Primarch of the Word Bearers. Lorgar was plagued by visions much like many of his brothers. This was due to his innate connection to the Warp, which was a result of his psychic powers. These visions would eventually lead him to create a doctrine that viewed the Emperor of Mankind as a god. His teachings would later form the basis of the Imperial Cult. Although not as powerful as Magnus the Red, he also was able to use his psychic powers to an incredible degree. He too was able to manipulate his appearance to a lesser extent. Many believed him to be a golden hue. 
This genetic vulnerability to psychic influence led his sons to develop more psychic powers than the regular space marines. This would later benefit his legion, as less word bearers suffered from physical mutations even when exposed to chaos. The space marines of the word bearers also displayed a marked tendency toward dogged, unquestioning belief and stubbornness that verged on insanity. Vulcan was the Primarch of the Salamanders, said to be the largest and strongest of the twenty Primarchs. Vulcan was an intimidating being, stoic and hardy in nature. He possessed a genetic mutation that altered his skin and gave it an obsidian black appearance, a trait passed down to his children. Vulcan also possessed burning red eyes that appeared to be ablaze in fire. He was a stubborn individual, a trait passed on to the salamanders, who are not swift to determine a course of action and slower still to change their mind once they have decided. The salamanders inherited the genetic mutation from Vulcan that allowed them to tolerate extreme temperatures, were extremely resilient to radiation, and had incredible cellular repair. Only the Death Guard Legion are on record as having a capacity to process and resist toxins that exceed the salamander's gene type. This variant gene seed also had some unusual outward effects. They possessed an ember-like bioluminescence to their eyes and a tendency for skin pigmentations to permanently darken in response to prolonged exposures to high levels of potentially harmful radiation as part of their biological defense mechanisms, often adopting an unnatural granite-like or obsidian quality with sufficient exposure. Corvus Corax, also known as the Raven Lord, is the Primarch of the Raven Guard. His skin was alabaster white, and he possessed shoulder-length hair as black as the feathers of his namesake, the raven. Most remarkable and unsettling were his eyes, which appeared as entirely black shards of solid shadow. These physical features were passed on to his children. The raven guards melanochromic organ that allows an Astarte skin to adjust to variable levels of solar radiation has a unique mutation that causes the skin of the raven guard to lose its pigment regardless of its original hue. Eventually, the space marine skin becomes pure white while the hair and eyes darken until they are jet black. Unfortunately, the genetic material of the Raven Guard was greatly damaged by the accelerated processes utilized by Korax to rebuild the Legion following the Dropsite Massacre. As such, the Raven Guard Astartes do not possess the mucronoid organ which allows the space marine to survive extreme heat cold or even exposure to the vacuum of space, or the Betcher's gland organ, which allows them to spit a venomous toxin. All of these genetic deficiencies destabilize most Raven Guard, and once the Astarte becomes unstable, they begin to mimic the sullen nature of their Primarch before his mysterious disappearance. This usually occurs in three stages. In the first stage, the Battle Brother is used to working in small Raven Guard strike teams, and finds the direct tactics used by other chapters to be brutish and ineffective. When commanded into a direct attack that he finds foolhardy, the battle brother is resistant almost to the level of disobedience. In the second stage, he becomes increasingly intractable. The battle brother is quiet and brooding. In mission briefings, he stays in the shadows, only speaking when absolutely necessary. For example, the fellow members of a Death Watch kill team would feel uneasy around the moody battle brother, tending to avoid him whenever possible. In the final and third stage, the Raven Guard despises the tactics of his fellow battle brothers, knowing that his more intelligent approach is the best way to victory. And finally, Alpharius Omega were the twin Primarchs of the Alpha Legion. Many reliable reports of the Primarch's physical appearance differ. While well, he is noted on many occasions to be a similar stature and size of many of his legionnaires, and able to pass unnoticed in their ranks, other records show him as towering and fearful figure, as were the other Primarchs. Despite the Primarchs' size, the Alpha Legion's gene seed saw incredible implantation success rates and was deliberately preserved separately as an isolated unit for other specific or military reasons possibly to act as a strategic gene seed reserve or indeed a control group as some have suggested. 
This theory also points to the possibility that the 20th Proto-Legion was held back to undergo some further development and conditioning unique to them and the rest of the Legionus Astarte. There remains evidence that the Alpha Legion gene seed led the Emperor to the later development and eventual creation of his personal cadre of transhuman protectors, the Legal Custodes. And those were 40 facts on the genetic flaws of the Primarchs and their sons. As you can tell, the Lion and Gilliman are not included in this list, and I probably missed a third guy. Or not missed, but didn't include the th a third Primarch, I believe, maybe? Uh, but the reason for me not including those three Primarchs or two Primarchs is because, in reality, their genetic uh, stock is... is is pretty good. Uh, there was no flaws within the genetic stock of Gilliman because obviously he had a bunch of successor chapters. Uh, he was Mr. Bombastic. His gene seed was strong. Um, there was a lot of successor chapters that might have had flaws later on, but that is because of the uh, actual founding and the deterioration of the gene seed because of the Adeptus Mechanicus or because of the Imperium not taking control of or not taking better care of the uh, gene seed, but not so much um, a genetic flaw f from the initial Primarch themselves. Uh, so I didn't include um, any successor chapters that are kind of obscure. Um, same thing with the lion. Uh, the lion, even though he had a lot of, even though he has traitor um, amongst his ranks, traitors amongst his rank, uh, being a traitor doesn't necessarily mean that it's a genetic flaw. It's just they either went to the wrong side or the right side, depending on what you believe. Um, so I didn't include those guys in here. Um, the third guy, I can't, I can't remember if there's a third guy. Comment down below. Uh, but also comment down below if I missed anything. Uh, like I said, um, there's a lot of successor chapters that I didn't talk about. But if you want to talk about them in the comment section below, please do so. Uh, also, if any of the Primarchs... Uh, special abnormalities I didn't include. Comment down below. I might have forgot some or a lot of stuff from different Primarchs. Love to hear from you guys. But now let's move on to the good stuff. Uh, we reached 100,000 subscribers thanks to you guys. Thank you so much. We cannot thank you enough or say thank you enough. Uh, we want to do a giveaway. Uh, we are doing multiple giveaways throughout this week. Uh, today's giveaway, well, I bought three starters, or I bought two th starter sets, a Chaos Space Marine starter set, and then, um, what are they called? The Tempestus Scion starter set. We're going to be giving those two starter sets away in a separate video. Um, for this video, I was going to originally give the Tempestus Scions, but then I decided, well, this is a Space Marine video. We have to give away Space Marine stuff, and I didn't want to do a, a Space Marine starter set giveaway because they're just regular space marines, you guys want Primaris marines. Um, so, of course, the Primaris marines uh, end up curing the genetic flaws that you hear about right now. Um, Psych! That's the wrong number! <laughs> so I said that intentionally to see how many of you guys I can catch, because I bet half of you guys went into the comment section and were about to, to rip me a new one, uh, because um, the Primaris marines actually did not cure any of the uh, flaws. Um, but yeah, I got you guys. Um, but yeah, okay, so I wanted to give away some Primaris stuff, so I'm giving away the starter set for, or the Primaris starter set, um, the thing you see on, on screen. I haven't purchased it yet, I'm gonna purchase it tomorrow when I go pick up my Forge Bane box set, um, so if you guys wanna win that, all you have to do is comment down below, if you haven't done so already, be a subscriber, that's the most important part, so make sure to hit the little bell notification icon right next to subscribe, uh, like this video, and share it with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media um, you use. Be sure to put your uh, YouTube channel on public so I can see that you are a subscriber and you can win this. Uh, the winner is going to be picked from the comment section below, and again... Thank you guys so much for subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much for listening to us every single day. And um, we couldn't do this without you guys. So if you want to win the prize that I have posted there, which is probably a Primaris Marine starter set, uh, simply just comment down below. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that thing that I just said. Thanks for everything, guys. This is a long video, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This is Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out.